we don't really know what's down the headline or anything, so he might be going up first. I don't know. I don't know just either, but I just signed in. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the media briefing for today. We have, we're very pleased to have Supervisor Luis Alejo, Monterey County First District, joining us at the top of the briefing. He has limited time, and we're really happy to be able to get him on to talk about the county's right to recall ordinance, which really was discussed for many hours yesterday at the board meeting. And Supervisor, I'm hoping you can tell us you know, how the vote ended up and what this ordinance will provide for local workers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maya. Certainly, I think we were, um, I think I was surprised uh, that the governor signed a bill that addressed the very issue on last Friday, Senate Bill 93, which gives the right to recall to hospitality workers on a statewide basis and gives a worker five days to be able to, to make a determination whether they would accept their jobs back. And it, the enforcement mechanisms to um, comply with that law was really put with the labor commissioner's offices throughout the state. Um, but since we had a pending referral um, and the state law allowed local governments to um, provide or enhance provisions for hospitality workers, that was really the basis of the debate, those points, uh, that critical points that were different than the state law. And in the end, uh, it was a vote by three to two. Um, and the key um, provisions were the enforcement um, and the Board of Supervisors um, decided to, to allow 
a private right of action to enforce our local ordinance in superior court, which was not allowed in the state law. And it also allowed for a reasonable attorney's fees for uh, a worker that would, if they were to prevail in court, what was not approved was the provision to allow punitive damages um, in that. The other part was how many workers are included. The state law uh, included hot hotel workers and also restaurants that are parts of hotels. But our, our uh, proposed ordinance um, was broader than that. It includes standalone restaurant and franchises. The board decided not to protect those workers, which are, are thousands um, in our county. And, and the other provision was whether when workers are called back, uh, does it apply only to, to the jobs they previously had or similar jobs that, that they had, or does it apply to jobs that they could be trained to do? Um, so in our local ordinance yesterday, they also decided not to include uh, the ability to be trained for jobs that, that they didn't do previously, but could be trained to do that was not included in our ordinance. So what are the next steps? Uh, after yesterday's vote, three to two, it still has to be finalized and published, I believe by Thursday, and then it will be included for a first vote um, officially from the, on the ordinance as it was drafted yesterday and approved yesterday. That will happen next Tuesday. And then I believe you have to wait another 30 days uh, for a second vote um, that is required on these uh, regular types of ordinances. So that's where we're at. Um, certainly, I think from the standpoint of our hotel workers who requested it, it, this, it wasn't what they had hoped to uh, uh, obtain uh, from their local board of supervisors. But certainly, I think we did get some added provisions that were not included in the state law SB 93. Thank you very much for running down a, just really a complete look because there was extensive discussion yesterday. And I think it's important for people to know when this will come back again next Tuesday so they can, uh, you know, get the complete in, more information next Tuesday as well and listen to it again and listen to everything that impacts these workers again. And yeah, I, and I one, one last point is that, that yes, our, our ordinance is proposed to uh, go through January 1st, 2022, which is the beginning of next year. The state law actually covers workers up until the end of 2024, but that that end date for the local ordinance can be extended if the board decides that it wants to do that early next year, or I would assume before that in December at the end of this year. So there are some differences that are important for people to know. And I do have some questions for you. And because Supervisor Alejo has to leave uh, the briefing, we'll take questions about the right to recall discussion right now. And I do have some questions for you, Supervisor. Uh, what provisions were removed from the ordinance that was sent to staff? I think you covered some of that. And what is the difference now between the ordinance and SB 93, the state's ordinance, the state's yeah, law, excuse me. It was just those, those provisions I mentioned because it was really, I think, uh, about four key points, which was what workers are covered. And I, and I had mentioned that that got, a lot of the workers that could have been covered got excluded um, and pr primarily in the franchises and standalone restaurants. The number two was, uh, when they get recalled to their jobs, is it only to the jobs they previously held or similar jobs to what they previously held? Or could it be other jobs that may be available to them if they could just be trained to do them? That was also removed. And the, the third part was the enforcement provisions. And there was the three pieces, uh, whether they could have a right to sue in the superior court, whether they could obtain reasonable attorney's fees, and whether they could be um, punitive damages, which, which is typical in, in the labor code for uh, weight, uh, labor violations. But that was also the punitive damage provision was removed. And then the fourth question was just how long was this going to be into effect? And that I just answered that it, it's, it's through January 1st, 2022. Thank you. And I noticed some people were just joining on as you were talking. So it's really great opportunity to reiterate that for, for people who didn't catch it the first time. Another question for you, Supervisor. Why do you think the original version did not uh, pass or was approved by the board? And are you surprised by this decision with your colleagues? Well, yeah, I was surprised because I, I made sure from the very beginning, even, even three weeks before I submitted it, I had met with, with uh, many workers on this topic who, who requested this resolution. And then I immediately reached out to the hospitality industry to get their feedback, get their input. Um, and I was uh, surprised that I would, because I was told back in January that they would not oppose it. They, they told me very clearly they didn't think it was necessary, but that it would, they would not oppose it. And obviously that's not what happened over the last few weeks as the decision was uh, uh, coming near. Uh, I think we saw the opposition, not only from hospitality, but from various chambers. And I think that was because I think there will be other city councils that will take up the similar measure. Monterey County Board of Supervisors was first, 
but it's likely that other cities like Monterey or Seaside or Marina or Salinas may council members may consider uh, also taking action to, to provide these enhanced protections to hospitality workers. Thank you very much. And I, I don't have any other questions for the supervisor in chat. Is there anyone else who has a question before he has to uh, step away from the briefing? I see nothing coming in in chat and hearing nothing. Thank you very much, Supervisor, for your time this, this afternoon. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to another very interesting topic on our briefing uh, today. We have Eric Chatham, who's the director of our uh, County Information and Technology Department. And he is going to share with us some information about the emergency, uh, excuse me, emergency broadband benefit program, which is something new and really will help people who have really been hit hard during the pandemic. Good afternoon. How are you doing, uh, Maya? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Eric Chatham. I'm the director of IT. I'm just uh, trying to see if I can get my screen to share here. Well, there's a lot of pressure there. Let's see here. Why is it not sharing here? It says I'm sharing. It says uh, we do see it. Oh, you see, the, you see the broadband? I do. OK, there we go. There we go. It, okay. It's better now. Perfect. Okay, so this is a new program that was uh, that recently uh, became is becoming available. It's a, it will actually be open up to um, individuals to register to at the end of this month. There's not been an actual date provided yet. I'll give you a link that you can uh, that constituents can go to to um, read more about what I'm going to cover right now, and as well as sign up for. But what is uh, the emergency broadband benefit program uh, due to the COVID ongoing COVID nine um, 19 pandemic, there was a $3.2 billion federal initiative to help lower the cost of high-speed internet. And the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program was a part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. What this benefit does for individuals that qualify, it provides up to $50 a month for discounted broadband services. If you're on tribal lands, the households on tribal lands, it's $75 a month. There's a one-time discount for, of $100 for laptops, desktops, or tablets purchased through uh, participating providers. And the emergency broadband benefit is limited to one monthly service discount and one device discount per household. Who, are they, who is eligible for this program? It's anyone that currently qualifies for the Lifeline program, um, which is a uh, for lower income. Uh, this is also anyone that receives benefits under the free and reduced uh, price school lunch program. Anyone that's experienced a substantial loss of income uh, since February 29th of 2020 and the household had a total income of in 2020 uh, below 99,000 or for single, for single filers or $198,000 for um, joint filers. If you received a federal Pell Grant in the current award year, and you meet the eligibility cri criteria for participating providers, existing low income or COVID-19 program. The uh, existing uh, participating broadband providers, there's a complete list that's at this link um, that's here, that's, which is at the www.usac.org. And you can go in there and look at their about and go to the emergency broadband uh, benefit program. And all the major providers are currently um, included in this, AT&T, uh, Charter Communications, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Comcast. And here's the one that's still uh, out there. It's it when to sign up. So it's currently not available. If you go to the site, it will say that uh, it's coming later in this month. There's not an actual given date. But if you go to this website, you can. Uh, they will announce a date, and then you can sign up for the, these benefits. And it's uh, www.fcc.gov slash broadband benefit. And that will also go over all the information that I just covered about qualifications and whether you qualify, who the participating providers are and the different uh, um, benefits that you can get from that. And with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation. I'd be glad to take any questions. Since we did take questions for uh, Supervisor Alejo, and I do have some questions coming in for you, Eric, so I'll go ahead and take them now. And if other people have some questions for Eric on the uh, this benefit program, go ahead and send them in. Um, 
Eric, is there a limit to how many people can apply locally? How will people be able to get the funds to help them pay their bill? So I'm trying to understand the question. So when you sign up, uh, anyone that's local can sign up by, at that website, and if you and you can read through the qualifications, and then those, then that uh, off that website, they will be providing all the information on how the funds will be uh, sent to them directly. And then I asked, Super. someone asked to I, add the link to the chat, so yeah. I will do that as soon as uh, and, we're done here. And I will also send out the link uh, by email for uh, people. Um, if they need it as well. Are there, um, good, more questions um, coming in for you. Um, could you define high speed and what is the status of fiber optic cable in the county? Uh, much broader question than this uh, particular program, <laughs> but uh, broadband is normally uh, considered um, most of the higher speeds over DSL, which is normally, you know, if you look in the business, it's somewhere between 70 or uh, and 100 megabit um, uh, download and 20 plus megabit upload. The there is, is across the county, there is our, a couple of our major providers, AT and T, Verizon, Charter Communications, have to most of the most of the city areas have pro services provided. Some of the rural areas are touched, but a lot of the Extreme rural, which is something we're addressing uh, through looking at how we uh, manage more of the digital divide. Uh, some of these services that are covered under, their, under the broadband services are wireless broadband. So you'll want to take a look at that when you go, when you log in and look at what services do they actually cover and provide. And I think it really was the digital divide that has really, that we discovered during the pan, well, not that we discovered, not some of us discovered as the pandemic uh, went on. This really helps sweep people up into being better connected as, as we have to be so distant for work or for school. Yes, it's driving quite a few bills at the um, state and federal level that have come across for that um, are trying to increase broadband into broadband levels as far as meaning speed and then access. Um, they're working with the providers. We're already working with providers, private and all the private sector providers and some of the mainstream um, service providers like AT&T, Verizon, Charter. We just finished a fiber rollout with Charter Communications recently. Um, that's been through a lot of the uh, more rural areas that they provide service to. And we're continuing to work on how do we expand that services to some of the other areas that are out there. And there are discounted services that we've helped. Um, the school system have that for a lot of the, um, um, the work for the folks that had to work from home and then had to educate from home. So we've got uh, um, a lot of people using cellular hotspots to get internet access. And we're expanding some of our um, internet access from our different buildings to outside public. Another related question, does the, do you know if the funding has a timeline and how long this would be available? I do believe there was a, a information. I don't have it handy right now. I'd have to go back out to the site again, but there was a limit on the timeline that they were going to have the funding available. But I can and get that information back out. Yeah, and I think this is really what we really want to do is drive people to that website and get the, it, it's, there's a lot of information there about who's eligible, how much, you know, the various levels. And then another question, does this include a discount for computers and other technology? And I think that that was included. Yes, there was, a, if I remember correctly, in the, it's $100 off for up to one laptop, one desktop or one tablet. And again, going to that website and getting looking through all of the all of the details will be really uh, helpful for everyone. Any other questions for Eric before we move on? I'm seeing nothing. So thank you, Eric. And if you're able to stay on the call, if there are any Eric questions, uh, we'll it would be we'll glad to have you. Um, stay on. And then so let's move on now to our COVID update. We have Dr. Moreno on the line and there was supposed to be a COVID presentation yesterday at the board, which uh, had to be postponed. So we're really happy to have a first look at our COVID information this week on the briefing. Good afternoon, Dr. Moreno. Yeah, good afternoon, Maya. So uh, let's see, as far as uh, vaccines, so our vaccine coverage continues to increase. Uh, there's at least 54% 
a Monterey County resident, 16 years of age and older, that have received at least one dose of COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So that's uh, continuing good news. And I still encourage anyone that's eligible to be vaccinated to schedule an appointment. And again, if people have difficulty uh, with internet, internet access maneuvering through the vaccine provider portals where they can schedule appointments, uh, I encourage them to ask a, a friend or family member for some help. They can also call 211. They can provide assistance with some of the uh, uh, portals and also any of the uh, appointments that are being made through my turn. Um, those individuals can also call the My Turn Assistance Line at 833-422-4255. Um, we are aware that the uh, Janssen vaccine uh, is uh, on pause at this point based on <clears throat> reports of uh, some rare uh, thrombosis events associated with thrombocytopenia or low platelets. And um, the FDA's uh, uh, had made the recommendation to pause the use of the vaccine. The CDC has alerted uh, healthcare providers uh, to watch for potential signs of uh, thrombosis in people who have been recently vaccinated with the uh, Janssen vaccine, and in particular, vaccine in the last three weeks. Um, and then um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice has been, had one meeting uh, on this issue. They have another meeting this week. Um, and uh, they'll be discussing available information and uh, potentially make a recommendation to the CDC on the use of that vaccine. As far as the state blueprint, uh, uh, the blueprint case rate and test positivity rate, excuse me, metrics for Monterey County still qualify us for the orange tier. And um, Monterey County would need to be in the orange tier for three weeks and meet yellow criteria for two consecutive weeks in, um, prior to the state uh, moving Monterey County into the less restrictive yellow tier. Uh, but it is still very important uh, in order to keep our case rates down, uh, reduce hospitalizations and prevent deaths uh, due to COVID. We still need to take measures to reduce the spread of COVID-19, which include uh, wearing face coverings when you leave your home, avoiding gatherings, washing hands frequent, frequently, uh, getting vaccinated um, and getting tested if, if, a, if you feel uh, if you experience COVID-19 symptoms or if you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19. Uh, the state uh, continues to update guidance. Uh, there is, uh, I encourage uh, individuals who are interested in, in the new guidance doc uh, to visit the state website. Um, there's a guidance document on gatherings. Um, the overall, the guidance does recognize that uh, in order to reduce the likelihood of transmission of COVID-19, uh, outdoor gatherings outdoor is safer than gatherings indoors. Uh, wearing a face covering is safer than not wearing a face covering. Uh, and other um, uh, and other measures to reduce the likelihood of transmission. That's all in the in the guidance document. But essentially, for orange tier gatherings are permitted with modifications, uh, and um, the outdoor gatherings are limited to a maximum of 50 people. And indoors, uh, those gatherings are strongly discouraged. Um, but there's a um, maximum of 25% capacity if there's a, a known capacity uh, or uh, 25 people, whichever is fewer. So that's one. And again, I encourage people to go to the website, state website to, if they're interested in uh, reading up more about these, that guidance document. There's also a guidance document that came out on private events that, that refers to meetings, receptions, and conferences. And in the orange tier, they are uh, permitted. Um, and uh, besides the modifications that are included in the guidance document to reduce the likelihood of transmission of COVID-19, uh, outdoor uh, private events are limited to 100 people. Um, but if all guests uh, can uh, demonstrate that they uh, have been uh, vaccinated um, and uh, have a negative test, recent negative test, uh, the state will uh, permit up to 300 people gathering outdoors. In terms of indoors for private events, um, if guests uh, have all tested negative or shown proof of vaccination, then up to 150 people can meet indoors for private events, such as meetings, receptions, and conferences. And uh, there's a couple more, Mayor, that I just want to point out um, this week. Uh, there's a guidance on indoor seating uh, for live events and performance. And um, those uh, indoor seated live events and performances are permitted in the orange tier. Um, with the modifications that are uh, detailed in the guidance on the state website. Um, the 
seated uh, live events are limited to in-state visitors. Uh, the, the organizers need to provide for weekly worker testing. Um, the workers uh, aren't required to test, but they are encouraged to take advantage of the employer's testing program. And all tickets must be uh, purchased, purchased uh, uh, online and, and delivered digitally. Uh, in addition, uh, there are also capacity limits for these events. Uh, for venues that typically can hold zero, zero to 1,500 attendees, there's a maximum of 15% or 200 people, whichever is less. Um, but, um, and then uh, as far as 1,500 uh, and higher, the maximum capacity is 10% or 2,000, whichever is less. Uh, and, uh, but that capacity can increase 35% of all guests show a uh, recent negative test uh, and or proof of vaccination against COVID-19. And then the last one I'm going to mention is that there's a recommendation that came up in uh, the state. Uh, it's public health recommendation for fully vaccinated people. So um, the state recognizes that uh, as more people get vaccinated, uh, we have more information about um, how likely uh, people who get vaccinated are, are to get sick if they're exposed and how likely they are to transmit COVID-19 um, if they were to get exposed. So based on um, increasing uh, information, the state has decided that, uh, has made a recommendation and that is that for uh, people who are fully vaccinated, which includes people that um, uh, have, have received their second shot, or it's been at least two weeks since they received their second shot in a two-day dose series, or it's been at least two weeks since they received their first uh, vaccine of a one-dose series like the Janssen & Johnson vaccine. Uh, they can spend time with other people who are fully vaccinated, uh, even indoors uh, without masks or distancing. Uh, the state also recommends that these individuals can spend time indoors without masks or distancing with unvaccinated people, but from one single household. And that those people have to be at low risk for severe COVID-19 disease. And um, again, I recommend people go to uh, the state to read up uh, on the details of these four uh, new guidance documents. Um, again, the state guidance allows for less restrictive measures as a greater proportion of the population gets vaccinated and drawing evidence shows that um, people who are vaccinated are less likely to spread COVID if they become infected with COVID. Um, but here in Monterey County, we're still seeing cases of COVID. Uh, people are still being hospitalized with COVID and people are still dying from COVID. So uh, in order, again, to keep our case rates down, um, keep our hospitals rates down and prevent deaths, um, I still uh, continue to recommend that uh, when uh, people leave the home that they continue to wear face coverings, um, avoiding gatherings, washing hands and keeping social distances still uh, uh, effective in decreasing transmission of COVID-19. Um, encourage people to get vaccinated um, and or uh, also to get tested if you have symptoms of COVID or you've been exposed to someone who has COVID-19. So that's my update this week, Maya. Thank you very much, Dr. Moreno. And we have some questions for you. So we'll go ahead and get started. In the last two weeks, there have been more than 20 COVID deaths. Are these new or is there a backlog in reporting? Could, could these deaths keep us in the orange tier or push us back into the red tier? Yeah, so thank you, Mayor. So yeah, we do report daily uh, on deaths, but we do um, have to reassign those deaths after we um, investigate, uh, do the case investigation. So that does change uh, over time. Um, I don't know, um, I don't have details today to, to uh, fully answer that question, but uh, what I, we do know is that um, the case rate continues to be low, um, positivity rate continues to be low. Um, and so, and the hospitalization, um, rates due to COVID-19 uh, are still low and our ICU bed availability is still adequate. So those are all, those are uh, considered precursors to um, uh, uh, right increase or changes in death uh, rates in the community. So as long as those remain down, I'm still hopeful that our, uh, our death rates will, um, a number of deaths will continue to be low. Thank you. Another question for you. Why hasn't Monterey County had a surge of COVID-19 cases even among young people, considering most 65 and older residents in the county have received the vaccine? Could a surge be viewed as somewhat beneficial since it would further promote herd immunity? So um, it's always 
uh, from a public health perspective, it's safer to get uh, a vaccine, uh, excuse me, safer to get um, uh, immunity through a vaccine than to actually get the disease. Um, if you get a disease, you're, you stand a chance of being hospitalized and dying. If you get a vaccine, um, you can suffer some adverse side effects and, and death from, um, but death from uh, post-vaccination is very rare. Um, so we would prefer that people get vaccinated rather than um, getting exposed and getting COVID-19 uh, disease itself. In terms of why we haven't seen a surge, we have had two surges, as most people know, and we just got through the, uh, the most recent winter surge. And uh, other parts of the country are experiencing uh, a surge in COVID-19 among uh, certain populations. Um, and in, um, in some communities in the United States, uh, it's believed that the increase is partly uh, due to increase in um, COVID rates among uh, young uh, individuals. I believe part of that is because those young individuals were the last to become eligible for COVID-19 uh, unless they were um, uh, in one of the priority groups. But we're also seeing increases in um, surges, excuse me, surges in other countries um, who are experiencing a lot of um, a high number of, uh, or an increasing prevalence of uh, COVID-19 variant viruses. So there are a variety of, of uh, proposed explanations for why there are surges in other parts of the United States and other parts of the world. Here in Monterey County in California, um, there is discussion about the, um, the transmission of um, the um, uh, West Coast variant, uh, which has really, the prevalence has really increased, or the proportion of, of excuse me, the proportion of uh, infections due to the West Coast variant has increased here uh, in California. Um, even though that virus is more transmissible than the original COVID-19 virus, uh, it doesn't appear to have much more uh, worse um, symptoms or increased uh, uh, mortality associated with it. So I think uh, some there's this discussion that perhaps uh, because that uh, uh, variant was introduced into California before uh, the um, more virulent um, uh, UK or um, South Africa variants, um, that there might have been an opportunity for people here in, in California to be exposed to a less virulent uh, virus and, and increase the, the herd immunity, so to, so to speak. We have yet to see whether or not uh, that's the case, um, particularly since there's so many uh, young people who haven't been vaccinated. Um, and, but it's really, I think, very important for all of us to encourage those of us um, that have uh, friends and family members who are um, younger and are, who are eligible uh, to get the vaccine. Um, and I think in doing so, uh, we'll be able to hopefully prevent uh, a significant surge. There may be a surge in the future, but hopefully we can avoid a significant uh, surge here in Monterey County. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Another question for you, and this goes, um, this is similar to a question earlier about the 20 deaths that the county has seen. Uh, are, could variants be tied to these uh, deaths? Um, good question. So um, we don't know that that's the case at this point, but what we are doing is um, Monterey County Public Health Laboratory is participating uh, in a statewide effort to um, do genomic sequencing on uh, known cases. Uh, and part of, and the reason we do that is uh, twofold. One is to identify um, uh, variants that may be responsible for uh, outbreaks uh, here in Monterey County. And we're also doing that to uh, determine whether or not some uh, cases uh, may be due to variants uh, some cases uh, may be second cases. So someone might have been infected already and they got sick with COVID again. Um, these are the type of situations that we're very interested in running genomic sequencing on. So we've asked healthcare providers or asked our hospitals uh, in particular uh, to forward to a sample so we can uh, up in certain cases so that we can test to see if variants are involved. So we are interested in testing specimens from people who have passed from COVID, uh, people who are admitted to the ICU with COVID, uh, individuals who were vaccinated um, and then uh, two weeks after, beyond the two weeks after the last vaccine developed COVID or people who've had COVID before um, and have recovered and uh, greater than uh, three months later, they get COVID again. So variants could uh, be the cause of those um, cases, more severe cases or recurring cases of COVID. So we are um, coll uh, collecting those type of specimens uh, to determine whether COVID variants have an increased um, uh, 
uh, role in uh, those type of uh, COVID infections. Thank you. Another question here. Um, some businesses have the option of requiring proof of vaccination to increase capacity. Uh, is, is that correct? And what would be considered proof of vaccination? So um, the, there are some state guidance documents that allow for increased uh, attendance uh, for certain type of uh, uh, events or activities. So um, I don't, I, I wouldn't be able to get to, to, excuse me, to review those at this time. That's a good question. Uh, but I would encourage people to um, go to the state website, uh, uh, the Blueprint website to identify those uh, activities or events that uh, California does allow an increased attendance uh, if people are vaccinated. Uh, the state also has, I believe, how the will issued um, uh, guidance on what serves as uh, proof of, of, uh, of uh, vaccination. Um, I know that the, uh, I believe that the, the vaccine cards that people receive when they receive their uh, vaccinations, that includes the uh, vaccine manufacturer and the lot number and the date that it was received. And that would be one form of uh, being able to prove uh, vaccination. But uh, I believe uh, the state is uh, working on this. Uh, the fact that the, the state acknowledges that by allowing um, increased attendance based on um, negative tests or, or uh, proof of vaccine uh, is going to increase the demand for um, simple, uh, reliable ways to show proof of a recent negative test or um, uh, proof of vaccination. So the state is working on that. And I'm hopeful that, that uh, they can come up with something that uh, can be used across California. Should people carry copies of their vaccine or vaccination cards with them at all times? I think that's up to individuals. I think uh, now uh, many people have um, uh, smartphones that have cameras built into them. So uh, in lieu of carrying a vaccine card around and possibly losing it, um, one option would be to um, take a picture of it and uh, with the camera and keep it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the album and in their in their own personal phone. And I think that's, um, that's that'd be a, uh, my recommendation um, because we don't know uh, in the, uh, yet what, um, uh, how that, how the vac proof of vaccination is going to roll out, but having at least something that uh, uh, you can uh, pull up uh, easily uh, in the future, I think would be um, uh, a good thing to do at this time. All right, thank you. Is the county health department seeing a demand for vaccine wane? And if so, why do you think that is? So as, uh, let's see, so as a vaccine, we're, so I um, am the director of public health and oversee the vaccine clinics for public health. And we haven't necessarily seen a, uh, a decline in demand for appointments. What we have seen though, is what we believe to be is some, uh, 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 no shows to uh, some of our clinics, and we have heard that other, uh, I believe the other vaccine providers have experienced uh, uh, a slight increase in no show rates. One of the things we think is, is happening is that people are uh, scheduling more than one uh, vaccine appointment, and so that they have options. Um, and uh, when they keep one appointment, they are uh, not going back and canceling the other appointments. Um, so I think that's one of the issues that we're, we're starting to see here. I do know that that's also, that is occurring or other counties believe that that's what's occurring in their counties as well. I think there still is a difference between our county and some other counties, such as some Bay Area counties with regards to demand. Um, Maya, you might recall that uh, based on the numbers of vaccines that were being delivered to multi-county entities and counties uh, in the early months, or early part of this vaccine campaign, it appeared that Monterey County was receiving a small proportion uh, of vaccine compared to other counties. So we still have, I think, some catching up to do. There are other, there are some Bay Area counties that have a, a greater percentage of their uh, eligible population having already received a um, first dose of vaccine. And uh, they are uh, beginning to see uh, an increasing proportion of, um, of people not showing up or, um, appointments not being uh, taken uh, by the time that uh, the clinic opens, some of their clinics open. So I don't, uh, I think we're a little lagging a little bit behind that, uh, those counties 
um, but uh, we're already um, recognizing that that is, uh, we'll get to a point where the people who have, uh, were very eager to get vaccinated have already gotten vaccinated. Um, and the people that were waiting to see what happened uh, are kind of, so to speak, on the fence trying to decide whether or not it's time for them to get a vaccine. And because that we, that's the type of uh, population that we really want to uh, message to. So um, the health department working with the, uh, our uh, contracted, uh, our contractor to assist us in uh, public messaging, uh, continue to look for uh, opportunities to get that information out. Uh, through um, social media and other media outlets, and also working with uh, uh, the foundation uh, to um, uh, encourage the uh, community health workers to um, engage uh, communities and individuals out in the community who uh, may be uh, hesitant, but eventually willing to get the vaccine and try to encourage them to get the vaccine now while vaccine uh, is available. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Here's another question for you. How close is the county to entering the yellow tier? What needs to be accomplished and for how long before achieving or being able to access the and move into the yellow tier? Uh, good question. Uh, so our uh, positivity rate overall in Monterey County and our positivity rate in the uh, uh, Healthy Places Index 1 uh, group our quartile is 1.2% uh, and 1.3% re uh, res uh, respectively. And so those two actually are in the yellow tier. Our adjusted case rate uh, is 2.7. It's been um, there uh, hovering around there for uh, a couple of weeks now. And uh, that is in the orange tier. And so in order to move, and so in order to, move to, the, um, to the yellow tier, we would have to have uh, our positivity rates remain in the yellow tier. Um, but our just the case rate have to be in the uh, meet yellow tier criteria for two consecutive weeks. So we're not there at this time. I can share that uh, we are, Monterey County is beginning uh, its third week in the orange tier. So um, by this time next week, Monterey County will have met one criteria, which is being in uh, orange tier for at least three weeks. And then we would have to meet the yellow criteria for two consecutive weeks. So I don't know um, if and when we'll get there. I just know that, um, um, one of the ways we got here is by people continuing to wear face coverings and uh, um, avoiding gatherings and keeping uh, social distance when they leave their homes. We need to continue to do that. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. I have a question here regarding uh, where the meeting, where this meeting can be seen. Uh, this meeting for for the person who asked if the meeting will the briefing will be on YouTube or Facebook. It is streaming on YouTube and Facebook and will be posted there uh, when the meeting is complete. So you can find it there. Another question for you, Dr. Moreno. Might we see a mask mandate for indoors only? So uh, thank you, Maya. Um, at this time, um, what we're we we in Monterey County are aligned with the state and uh, face covering uh, guidelines and requirements that the state is issuing. Um, so I don't know that there will be. Um, I don't know that the state has plans for just having an uh, indoor masking mandate only. I think it's. Um, I think the state is looking, trying to look carefully at uh, different situations, different scenarios, different venues, different types of events, and looking at uh, doing, conducting uh, risk assessment uh, in those particular settings and, and the making uh, guidance on use of face covering uh, uh, for different types of venues. So uh, we do know that the face, uh, the state has, uh, as I mentioned, issued guidance for uh, people who are vaccinated that um, doesn't require use of face coverings indoors. Uh, uh, but there are other indoor uh, uh, events or activities uh, such as uh, sh uh, shopping and retail where masked indoors is required. So an indoor only or um, it would not probably be expected from the state at this time. I think if the state is tr again trying to look at each situation carefully doing some risk assessment, risk of transmission in, in particular settings under certain circumstances and then issuing guidance that uh, they, uh, the state believes would be most um, a good balance between uh, protecting uh, people from uh, exposure to COVID-19 while still uh, allowing for um, activities to slowly return to uh, pre-COVID type of uh, uh, conditions. 
Thank you for that. Um, I, I have another question here, and it relates to an earlier question about uh, how people show that they're fully vaccinated and that there are options for business businesses to have people in attendance if they are fully vaccinated. Um, so uh, the question says, I saw a note on the state's website that suggests restaurants and even the aquarium can actually increase their capacity if all guests are attending are fully vaccinated from 50 to 75%. Is the county allowing this? And if so, how is the county instructing restaurants or the aquarium, for example, to do this? It seems like there would be some type of HIPAA violation in asking people if they are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, ma'am. So the, a few things there. So in terms of um, uh, the guidance documents, I just shared a few of the uh, new guidance that came out. There's other uh, guidance that uh, involves a number of uh, participants on the state's website. So again, I encourage people to go to the website because there, there are many, many uh, guidance, uh, a lot of guidance out there uh, that uh, with details on the website that people can look at. Um, I'll try to answer part of the question. One was, you know, how do, how do we um, uh, enforce the, uh, the guidance in restaurants? Um, that one in particular is handled by uh, environmental health environmental health for the county uh, has um, throughout this pandemic has been uh, engaged with uh, restaurant owners and managers um, to uh, educate, uh, inform, educate, and uh, assist in interpreting state guidance um, as guidance continues to change for restaurants. And um, uh, environmental health has reached out time and time again to uh, restaurant owners and management to make sure that they understand um, uh, what is required of them what, and what is recommended of the, to them uh, by the California Department of Public Health. In terms of the uh, large venues such as uh, the aquarium, um, that is something that we uh, in the health department have made ourselves available uh, to in terms of uh, being able to receive um, uh, questions from uh, the operators of those type of uh, venues. Uh, in terms of interpreting the state guidance. And uh, I think uh, we've, um, again, we've made ourselves available. We'll continue to make ourselves available um, to uh, those who are running those operations to make sure that they um, hopefully understand what is uh, required or recommended of them in order to uh, be open with modifications uh, to patrons and, and customers uh, to provide uh, as safe as possible uh, an environment where uh, transmission is, is greatly reduced and people can enjoy um, visiting those, uh, those venues. Thank you. And this appears to be our last question. Have there been any COVID clusters or outbreaks coming from Monterey County schools or youth sports as reopening has gone along? I'm not, thank you, ma'am. I'm not aware of uh, outbreaks uh, in, in schools per se. We do get reports uh, from schools periodically about um, cases or exposures that they're aware of. Um, and we do have uh, individuals that are uh, working in our case investigation team and our contact tracing teams that uh, are primarily trying to focus their time on, on school related exposures and um, and uh, cases. And um, so we do, we do occasionally get reports and we follow up on those. But at this point, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, outbreaks that have resulted in a need to um, go from modified or in-person to um, in-person instruction or modified uh, instruction to um, uh, distance learning completely. So I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that. We also, and, and that's consistent with what we've been, uh, information sets, um, coming out of um, some studies and experience across uh, across the US that uh, transmission and particularly among the um, lower uh, grade levels in schools uh, between the students um, is much less common than transmission among uh, adults during this pandemic. So we would uh, expect and hope, hopefully we will uh, see uh, very few uh, or no outbreaks as we move forward. We do know that we've got um, older uh, students that are older uh, that we should be returning back to school for in-person instruction. So uh, we will continue to work closely with the schools uh, and respond as quick as possible to any um, uh, reports of cases or exposures, uh, particularly in the older uh, ages, um, grades such as, as high school. 
Thank you, Dr. Moreno. That is all the questions that I have in chat. And I'll ask for any final questions for Dr. Moreno or Eric Chatham, who is still on the line, anything uh, for him. Giving it a second here and seeing no other questions, that'll wrap up our briefing for today. Thanks everyone for taking part. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bye, man.